tardes a todos y vamos a, vamos a ver si empezamos. Mi nombre es Archer Lebron y soy miembro de la Junta de Directores de los Industriales. Es un honor para mí estar aquí. Yo presido, la razón por la cual estoy aquí es que yo presido en los industriales, como si fuera un full time job para mí, a pesar de que pro bono, pero es un trabajo full time. Presido, aparte de ser miembro de la Junta, presido el Comité de Tecnología y Telecomunicaciones. En ese sentido he tenido mi este, reuniones con Sandra y hemos discutido alguna estrategia. Y presido también el Comité de la Diáspora, que por primera vez los industriales está trabajando de cerca con, con la diáspora puertorriqueña en una iniciativa luego del huracán para converger todo lo que tiene que ver con la iniciativa de reconstrucción y el sector privado y que se vea como un, un país unido en ese sentido. So I'm just doing an introduction here, Kim, right? Uh, eh, y conmigo, pues, me siento sumamente orgulloso del panel. Uh, I feel so proud to have all of you here, distinguished leaders of our industry, with us today. Uh, because I know today everyone is so busy. My friend was here today when he went to Cambio de Inglés. I'm going to respect to Kimberly because she's not going to be here. So sorry. <laughs> so, so today, or nowadays, uh, Puerto Rico's leaders have a very strong challenge. Right? It's, a, it's a multitude of challenges, actually. It's number one, how do we come together? Uh, number two, how do we uh, become selfless in our own way so we can integrate into something bigger that makes our country uh, functional? And how, how do we break paradigms uh, to rebuild Puerto Rico under a new business economic model, if you will? And that's, that's a tough challenge under the times we're living. So in that, in that line, I truly just want to take this 30 seconds to, on, on, my, on behalf of Rodrigo Masters, President of the Puerto Rico Manufacturing Association, and my own, truly appreciate, in my heart, the fact that you guys made it, and thank you so much. So, so with that, uh, I'm not even supposed to be speaking. This is supposed to be Jose, Jose Luis Rosa. I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> I'm just trying to help you out, help me, help me, you know? and, uh, and my appreciation for all of you being here, thank you so much. I also want to excuse Rodrigo Masas, our president. He was supposed to be on that panel, and he had to take a, a plane this morning, and he excused himself. On his behalf, we're going to be having Frank, Frank Rodriguez. Wow, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> Thank you. Right. So with that, I'll, I, I, since we're a small number here, instead of me talking about each of these leaders, I'll just give them the two minutes so we can talk about what, who they are and what they're doing. Frank. Sure. Well, uh, good afternoon, and, and again, thank you for inviting me here, uh, Arja. I, uh, uh, anyway, I'm very uh, proud to say that um, you know I work for Milan. Milan it's a pharmaceutical company, a multinational uh, pharmaceutical company. We operate in uh, 165 countries. We're about 35,000 people. Uh, we've been established here in Puerto Rico for 31 years now. Um, we've, uh, we have about 500 employees in Caguas. Um, so we have a, a site in Caguas, about a campus of 15 acres. Um, so we uh, produce uh, uh, my equivalent, a generic, Oral solid dosage products at that facility. Um, products that are you know, very important for um, uh, organ re re rejection, uh, different types of cancers like leukemia, uh, some hormonal products, uh, high, um, high blood pressure, uh, prostate. Um, so, very, very important products. About 40 different products, uh, about 3 billion, 3 billion doses uh, a year. Milan is a, is a very large company, uh, like I said, 165 countries, uh, mm -hmm. and we have 40, around 45 manufacturing sites, so we, we truly operate uh, in a global environment, and we have about 10 uh, research and, and development centers uh, across the world. Um, so, I don't know what else I did. No, that's that's well. fine, and with that, what I want yeah. to say, the, uh, the format of our discussion will be, each of the members will be providing us with an input, on what is it that they're doing in their respective organizations. Sure. That's kind of like the reason why they're here. Uh, so it's important we find out who they are first, and then we get into 
their five, six minutes in terms of what is it that they're doing, and then we get into the questions, okay? And with that, Emilio, we also have Emilio. Emilio is a president of a new, uh, other respected organization, but I'll have him talk about that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Emilio Colón Zavala. I am a professionally licensed engineer here in Puerto Rico for the past 27 years. Uh, I have my own practice, an engineering services consulting and a construction firm here in Puerto Rico for the last uh, 10 and a half years. So since, since last year, I've taken the role of being the chairman of the board for the Puerto Rico Builders Association. Uh, we are the local chapter of the National Association of Home Builders and the Urban Land Institute. So when the storm hit a uh, uh, year and a half ago, we started doing research on how other jurisdictions dealt with such a disaster. Okay? And with that in mind, we established a not-for-profit organization that is uh, an arm of the Puerto Rico Builders Association, which is called HBA of Puerto Rico Community <coughs> Development Corp. And with having the reconstruction and the disaster relief in, in mind, we've established uh, three initiatives that we are currently working on for uh, community resilience and reconstruction. The first one is uh, an initiative in Yabucoa, in El Negro, in which we will be working with the community to relocate around 16 families that are a community of squatters and they have invaded because they needed a house uh, for them and they've been there for generations but after Maria hit they decided that it was time for them to find a safer place so we are trying to do a pilot program in which they will be empowered for being relocating to a safer place and a more resilient housing for them to be able to withstand the next natural disaster. The second initiative we're working on is uh, and dealing with the problems with the American Community Survey as published by the Census Bureau. We are proposing to do a uh, an income limit study for Puerto Rico and validate what HUD has proposed. Dealing with the income limits, as you probably know, here those limits are way too low when affordable housing units need to be filled. So what we found out is that the, the Congress uh, required HUD by law to take into account the national poverty level when dealing with the 50%. Unfortunately, territories are exempt from that rule uh, because we feel that it is uh, too low. We are proposing to perform a study in which we will comply with federal regulations and try to move uh, HUD to accept uh, a new study for it. And finally, we are the, the last alternative the last initiative, I'm sorry, that we're working on it's a construction workforce uh, readiness and training program and certification program. That initiative is being implemented right now through the public education system. HBA of Puerto Rico entered into a contract with the Department of Education to help the department train, certify uh, high school seniors who would want to, their path would be to go into construction, that they would graduate from high school in May they will get a, a nationally recognized construction readiness certification. They will get the OSHA 10 hour certification also, safety certification, and they will also be certified to earn a minimum salary of $15 an hour as per the uh, governor's executive order 2018-33. Uh, that program will start training the trainers in April 1st, which is a week from today, essentially, with students uh, starting around the 24th of April. Uh, we will be training up to 84 students in 84 public uh, institution, uh, schools. 
and we plan to impact up to 2,100 students this May. And after that, we'll keep building. Uh, they will get a core course uh, for the beginning, and we'll start doing some trades, starting with carpentry. And after, apparently my time is up. <laughs> out to uh, some private institutions and NGOs later in the year to deploy the program in more places so we can we can impact as many students as we as we can. Perfecto. But uh, what I want to do moving forward because I have to come back then to Frank so he can have his five, six, seven minutes. Sure. I just want to do a quick introduction of like your role, I mean who do you represent in your role so we can all have a good idea and then we get into the details. We already heard Immediately, we could come back to Emilio later on with more uh, uh, details and questions. So, so Jose Luis, tell us about yourself. Don't get into your projects, just tell us a little bit about <laughs> okay. it. Uh, I, I have a couple of hats here. You saw I took one off, but I have others. Um, uh, first, um, I'm the president of CRG Communications, or Campo Rico Group, which is the only commercial satellite teleport uh, based uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, I'm also a member of the board of Caribbean Preparedness and Response, which is a nonprofit organization that is uh, targeting uh, the use of satellite technology to create an emergency resilient network um, in Puerto Rico, including multiple sectors in Puerto Rico that, um, uh, that, that were very instrumental uh, in getting Puerto Rico up and running. And uh, the last thing, I'm also, as well as Archer, part of the executive uh, committee of the IDEA Común, which is the organization that is sponsoring this. And it's very important that we put this um, event in context. Uh, those of you, how many of you were here this morning? In the journal session. Yeah, okay. Maybe some of us were, some of you might not have been here. But it's very important what, uh, what is the objective of the conference and what we're trying to do here in this panel. Uh, uh, this morning, it was very, two well, very good presentations, well, more than two presentations, and it was very clear that uh, there is an intent, uh, an effort uh, uh, to work with the Puerto Rican diaspora to try to um, ec not only continue the, the uh, uh, the assistance that have been given to Puerto Rico through various means, but also in this case, to try to build a, uh, a training or uh, capability, because Puerto Rico, and that's why we're all here, will receive an, in, uh, an enormous amount of funding. And there is concern that Puerto Rico might not be prepared to utilize all the funding that is gonna be available. So uh, the Centro de Estudio Puerto Ricano is trying to have developed a curriculum to try to uh, prepare uh, uh, community organizations, uh, the business sector also, all the sectors that could apply for uh, funding for those needs that have been identified, helping the government of Puerto Rico do that. Because we believe that the government, with all the best intentions they have, might not be in a position to apply for everything that is going to be available. And New Orleans is a very good example of what that. There, is, uh, there are three questions that, that uh, the, 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 um, the group would like to see answered. Is what projects you're working in right now? Uh, what, uh, what kind of assistance uh, is needed for those projects? And we want to hear from you know, these, panelists. these panelists too. You know, what are you working on? Uh, and, 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 and from you also, and to see where there is synergies, where we can work together. That's the main focus here. Also, um, uh, what kind of recommendations you can make uh, in terms of how to strengthen that particular objective of getting that training going? Where, you know, give us directions and give us ideas as to how we can, Puerto Rico can best benefit from that. So that's my thank you. Thank you. 
or Sandra. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Sandra. I am the president of the Telecommunications Regulatory Board and now Telecommunications Bureau. I'm also the executive director of the Human Resources for the Government of Puerto Rico. But, but today, I'm going to talk to you about my responsibility in terms of the telecommunications sectors as an ESC, ESF, excuse me, number two, emergency support after, during and after an emergency, how it needs to work together with the private sector, with the private telecommunication industry to keep the people in Puerto Rico with the necessary tele telecommunications and data services after that. Thank you, excellent, beautiful. Javier. Javier Jimenez, uh, I am part of the Puerto Rico Primary Care Association. So we cover, we are in 58 towns uh, through Puerto Rico, Vieques and Culebra, taking care of over 370,000 people, roughly 12% of the population with all the migration mm -hmm. that has happened. We have people in Caguas, in Yabucoa, <laughs> everywhere you have a tower, we have people. So, yes. uh, you know, in, in that sense, we cover everyone. And I'll go into other things that we're working Excellent. on. Javier was a buddy of mine. We were co-workers at IBM once upon a time. Once upon a time. And I missed the presentation. I just got off the plane. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> I just got off the plane. It was straight from uh, Florida, was it? Or? Tampa. Tampa. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, Kimberly, welcome to Puerto Rico. I know you leave tomorrow, but uh, thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm uh, becoming Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Figuratively and literally, I hope. Um, hi, I am Kimberly King. Um, I, like many of you, wear multiple hats. I am the co-founder and executive director of a nonprofit called One Island Institute that was created in the Indian Ocean in Mauritius. And we work on special projects with island nations and territories, although one island means that in the end we're all one. Um, I also uh, am part of a consortium, uh, Puerto Rico-based group called the Regenerative Development Group, or Region of Development. And we are working on projects across the board from technology to health to agriculture to building. Everybody here on this panel is very relevant to me and vice versa. But at the end of the day, I, I care about the principles of resilience, sustainability, adaptability, no matter what work you're doing and as a process, collaboration, and multi-stakeholder starting with the community itself, that we are the ultimate stakeholder of the future. So Puerto Rico is at a profound moment, and I am proud to be a small part of it. Thank you. So as you can see, our panel, we have private sector, we have the technology and the telecommunication sector, we have the health sector, we have housing sectors, we have international representation as well, so it's all coming together, as I explained at the beginning. So, so with that, uh, I'll leave Frank. Frank has a story he wants to share with us. He's working closely with uh, in some communities and his organization. So, so can you talk to us? Sure. Thank, thank you, Archer. And so um, again, so I told you who I am and, and who I work for. And um, so, uh, you know, after the Hurricane Maria hit, I mean, I think we we're all you know very. Uh, affected by, by what happened. I mean, we had about, um, I, I wrote it down here so I didn't forget, uh, uh, 11 families that have a total loss of uh, their house. And we had uh, 21 families that had uh, partial loss. So the company uh, gave us $250,000 to help uh, either through rebuilding their homes and buying uh, whatever they needed for their homes as well as so paying rent, those that couldn't live with uh, someone else. But that was just a small, uh, a small piece of the, the, the things that we could do for our own, for our own uh, employees, right? But we live in a much larger community. We live in Puerto Rico, and, and we're very much associated with Puerto Rico. We've been here 31 years, um, and our main uh, reason is, is to continue to be here. You know, we, we need to continue to operate here, and we need to, and we have a lot of competition around the world. Um, and part of it is to motivate our work, uh, workforce. Um, so there was a, um, besides what happened here in Maria, uh, our main company, our main 
U.S. headquarters operates in West Virginia, in, in uh, Morgantown. So about maybe a year or so ago, there was a heavy flooding in Morgantown. I don't know if you heard about it. Uh, the, the, so it affected a lot of families. And we have about 10,000 people that work there. And they were directly affected. So Milan, you know, looked at a, through an organization uh, that would, uh, you know, that would be a very effective and efficient use of the, the funds to help rebuild homes. And so they associated themselves with a company called SBP. Uh, so SBP is a company that was founded right after Katrina. They still operate in, in, in areas where there's, there's been hurricanes, like in New Orleans. Um, West Virginia, they're still operating there, and here in Puerto Rico. So we provided SVP with uh, $1 million funding to start rebuilding houses here in Puerto Rico. Um, the goal is to, uh, for them to, uh, we build uh, through this funding to build about 100 homes, not just the, the, the million dollars is the initiation to, uh, uh, to set up operations here. But the goal is to, to build 100 homes this year. Uh, we are right now working on the 19th home. Um, and we're operating in the areas, uh, right now in the areas of, um, we, don't, we don't operate throughout all of Puerto Rico um, because there's so many. We identified 423 homes. And uh, yeah, so here it's, we're operating in the areas of San Juan, Luisa, de Abucoa, Carolina, and Canovanas. And so there's 423 homes that we identified in those areas. So besides the, uh, the funding, um, you know, we also support them with volunteers. Now, SVP is a company that uses AmeriCorps and, and tradesmen, um, tradespeople, I should say. Um, you know, and, and that is, it, it's sometimes it's very difficult, uh, particularly now, right, to get. Uh, so they're very efficient at finding those traits, uh, people to, to do the work in very efficient use of, of their labor. And that's what prompted us to associate ourselves with, with them. So we volunteer a group of uh, our employees who once, a, once a month to go and, and, and help in a particular home. Uh, so besides building the home, you know, there's an association with that person. Uh, we recently went to an opening, uh, uh, sort of every time the house gets finished, we have a ceremony. Um, so the later ceremony was in Mrs. Sanchi's house in Villa Palmera in Carolina, uh, where we give the owner the, the keys. It was very emotional. Uh, you know, all of the volunteers that work there, uh, they attend. Um, we started now in two homes, one in uh, Luisa and one in, in Piñones. And you get to meet the owner, you get to talk a little bit about what, what, who's the owner, there's a biography about the person, you get to meet the family. Um, and the other thing is that our employees then get involved in not only building the home, but then uh, where SVP doesn't get involved is really buying uh, all the things that the, 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 the home needs, right? It's not just the walls, and, but it's, you know, if they need beds, if they need, uh, you know, uh, all the things that they need for their home. <coughs> so we, we buy them, we associate ourselves with uh, Mobilias um, Berrios and, and others, uh, and we look out there who we do business with and, and try to get money as well to, to help them. Um, so that's what we do. And SBB is is um, is committed to stay here beyond the hundred homes. Right? It's not just that. That's our goal with them, but they're committed to do, to do here. And Rodrigo and, and Archer and they they given us uh, a little bit of. Uh, forum to promote them as well. Um, and no matter who you associate with, I mean, as long as you do good, but as long as you put that money to good use and you see it to the end, you know, it's not, it's not a partial thing. It's not just, you help them a little bit, but that help is not enough, and then, and then it just falls back. So, you, you know, you give the family a place where it's secure, un lugar digno, uh, and, and then they have a, 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 the basis to, to go forward with, right? So, and, and that's our intent. And that's, cool. that's what we do. Good, that's great. And we'll get to questions in a bit. Sure. Let me jump to Javier because uh, you already heard a little bit about me. We'll get to the media later on. Uh, let me let me listen to Javier and what he's doing with the health sector. Sure. Uh, 
I'll go back that every time you mention, we have patience. <laughs> there probably well, there's are. There's needs everywhere. Yeah, there probably are our patients. Why? 70% uh, of our patients are Medicaid. Uh, mi salud, vital, como le quieran llamar, you know, over 200% uh, below the poverty level. Um, and spanning everyone. After Irma and Maria, it's both affected uh, those remote areas. Um, power was an issue. I don't have to say that. Uh, the problem with our centers is that they were the only medical uh, uh, services being provided around the island in these remote areas. If you go to Castanet for over eight months, we were running on generators. Eight months. So you have a hospital and the, and the clinics running diesel. Uh, so and a lot of cases like that. So Irma helped us because immediately we went to, uh, our team went to the centers, not expecting them to communicate, trying to do the needs assessment. So we started analyzing, look, if Maria is going to be as we think it is, we need to start getting ready with other type of generators. Um, because we knew, you know, these generators are not built to be running days or weeks, let alone months. And the government will do what the government does. It is not that they failed in Puerto Rico. They fail normally every time there's a disaster of this space because of the way the government works, the way they need to set up things. That's why the community and different NGOs and the private sector are so important in holding the fort while then the government gets their thing rolling, right? Um, so we started getting, uh, we have been helped with Direct Relief International Medical Corps, uh, AmeriCares, uh, Clinton Global Foundation, you name it. They have uh, many pharmaceutical companies through AmeriCares and Direct Relief donated millions and millions of dollars in medications that free for all of our patients. Um, but some of those medications, you mentioned cancer, we can also think of all the insulins, or many of the insulins need to be, have a custody of, of, of the cold chain. La temperatura de esos medicamentos tiene que estar bien regulada. So we had to get smaller generators, so when the big generators were uh, being changed, oils, belts, uh, maintenance, resting, we would have small uh, gas generators running the fridge uh, at night. Then we started talking about solar panels, small uh, uh, enough that we could, uh, we have 97 clinics. Um, so we have to uh, make sure that those that have uh, vaccinations to comply with the federal and the local laws, that if we didn't have uh, energy, two or three uh, energy sources, we would not have vaccinations for those patients. So, you know. That's part of what we're doing now. Uh, uh, Direct Relief got a big donation. Silicon Valley uh, Community Foundation has helped Fundación Comunitaria de Puerto Rico. So we have been working installing many solar panels and batteries, larger generators, larger um, diesel storage tanks um, for that energy needs. Uh, I'll give an example on Arroyo. Our clinic in Arroyo is going to save, uh, or is currently saving over $90,000 a year because of the solar panels that, that were installed. So we need to think that, yes, we're getting ready for the next disaster, but these also, there are some of these projects that help the day-to-day -day operations. So the idea is that you're getting this for free, but you need to take those funds that you're saving and uh, provide more access, provide better services, and, and other type of things. Uh, in Arroyo, talking about satellite, we also created a community hub. So we got a donation from uh, International Connector and Viasat, which is a <coughs> satellite company. So now we have the fiber, we have copper, we have microwave, we have satellite, we have plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. But the idea is that if a storm is coming, we can take down that uh, satellite antenna. If we lose everything again, we pop up the antenna, 
and we're able to not only communicate, and, and so we don't have to go doing the needs assessment, we get everyday information on what's going on, the situational awareness that we need. Um, but also we can provide text uh, service access to the patients, which helps on the mental health side not only for the people here, but for the diaspora that, you know, they were like, oh, a nuclear bomb fell and, and everyone is dead. So we needed to address that too. Um, so in training, uh, thinking of the, the training, you know, solar panel installation, battery installations, that type of thing would be helpful. Uh, on the water side, water was very important. Uh, yes, we have large uh, containers retaining water, but uh, even if you go to Aguada, people will steal at night the water from our clinic. So in some places we are doing uh, pozos, uh, wells. Uh, in Castaner, we were lucky that we had a well already, so they provided to the entire community uh, 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 water and food and everything. That was a center of, of, of that service. Um, on training, uh, incident management system, which is the actual emergency response type of, uh, of, uh, of procedures that are normally followed or should be followed. Our, our, in Puerto Rico, the largest problem we had is that that wasn't done. It was no organization? No, no. And I can say the name, Pesquera was Pesquera, and, and there was not an incident management person that would run the whole thing and then divide it as the plan uh, deems. So that everyone can know who's who has what, where, when, what's needed. That's a good point. Uh, on the water side, I also want to add that we're working on uh, uh, starting to look at uh, rain collection, so that that water we can use for the bathrooms and other things, great water type, uh, not drinking water, but you know uh, that we can address that. Uh, one more thing, and we're working on a mesh uh, technology. So basically off the telecommunications, but making a mesh of several of our clinics so that if we lose everything, even the, the satellite, we can communicate between each other. Mm -hmm. So the police or you know the incident manager can come sit there because the community came to, to our center for everything, for clothing, for food, anything we could get our, for diapers, diapers, adult diapers. So, you know, many, many things. The last thing on telecommunications, if you want to know more about the 5G and the rollout, but also on the low tech, low tech, uh, 2G things and, and that we can use on an emergency. We're looking at uh, telemedicine, teleconsult, telemonitoring, so we can take care of our elderly. That's actually what I was doing in, in Tampa. We're bringing a solution for the opioid and mental health that we can screen easily, not necessarily at our centers, but as we went barrio to barrio, and, and Utuado is a great example, Utuado also has a Viasat a satellite, um, <coughs> that we can easily gather the information securely, protecting all the HIPAA uh, information, uh, but that those people, in the, our clinic in Utuado is in the center of town. So if you go to Cayuco, uh, uh, Paseo Palmas took two hours to get to. We had to go to uh, Ayuya because all the bridges that fell. Uh, Caguanas is half an hour, normally it would be an hour. So you, if you're providing services, you better have some sort of communication. If, 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 if the telcos are up, great. If not, you know, there's balloons that we're looking at. There's not the loon balloon, but actually small balloons that really worked. Uh, and and this mesh technology that you can, it's military grade that recognizes all the antennas that are available. And if there's a fiber in Kimberley's center, everyone goes through there. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's part of what we're working on. That I, I, I find very insightful, all the information you're bringing. And I like the fact that you're sharing with the peers in terms of opportunities that we need to improve. So thank on you. The, on that. the housing side, uh, yeah. our our executive directors and you know they're they know the community. If you go to Salud Integral in La Montaña, they have Orocovis, Corozal, Comerillo, uh, Bayamón, Tobabaja, you know, they, they their center over there got flooded. The one in Comerillo, the river rose over fifty feet. Over fifty feet. It got to the only pharmacy. So 
our clinic was the one that we, we were given medications. So uh, if you want to know who needs housing, they, they normally do because they, they also receive federal funding for that type yeah, that of that was mentioned this morning in your general presentations. So, so thank you so much, Javier. And in your line of thought, I want to invite uh, Sandra because I think she's, she was there from day one, you know, yes, uh, re reacting to the emergency. And you, you have a wonderful story. Yes, yeah. it's, not a, it's not a good news say to other things that no ones were prepared for the type of hurricane mm -hmm. that attacked Puerto Rico. And the telecommunications sector was not the exception. Uh, I'm going to say some things in Spanish because I were prepared my presentation in Spanish and may translate to the English. But for example, after the mat, we went to the convention center and we have a war center on there, which we have uh, meetings twice a day with the telecom industry. But also, we had a meeting with the FEMA guys and the uh, pharmaceuticals and banks in order to support all together and thinking about what we are going to do uh, facing uh, the destruction that we had in Puerto Rico. After that, we had been part of the IT comm sector, working hands by hands by FEMA, and we are continuing doing so on a daily basis in the meeting that we had with them. There is a lot of code of action with the IT comm sector that has been approved and we are dealing with and trying to work with, but I'm going to mention almost two of them uh, today. For example, we have radio communications. The communications with the whole police departments, uh, health departments, and the communications of uh, government communication was lost since the beginning of the hurricane. Now we have 145 radio communications for the installation to the whole municipality, emergency uh, parts of each municipality, hospitals and first responders. Uh, yeah, it has been installed already as Sivena for the Waga, Waga, Guajataca Dam mm -hmm. that is already installed. We have agreements, uh, collaborative agreements with the radio aficionados, especially with the radio relay leaks because they play an important uh, work during the emergency and they try to keep people communicated mm -hmm. when the whole communications in the government and in the private sector was going off. Uh, we have also uh, now in Puerto Rico the infrastructure of FirstNet. FirstNet is, uh, has a lot of uh, installations in terms of uh, fiber optic in Puerto Rico around the islands. Uh, it has been made by AT&T, who was the one who signed with the federal government for the uh, first net. Puerto Rico government has signed as opt-in for half first net here in Puerto Rico for the first responders in case of an emergency. In terms of the private sector, the providers, uh, after the experience of the Hurricane Maria and taking the a consideration that we are an island and the ports were closed, they have inventory on their local sites. A big, huge inventory. And how I know it? Because we certify them by annually for them to obtain the Universal Service Fund. And we requested to them an inventory a disclosure of inventory, also it's confidential for the, uh, for the rest of the people. We sign an agreement with them and they provide to us each inventory that ha they had on site for uh, any uh, emergency that occurs going on. For example, after the Hurricane Maria, they have small sales on the wheels in Puerto Rico. During the hurricane, they tried to bring the cells on the wheels to Puerto Rico, and during the first two or three weeks, was impossible to do in so. Major amounts of cold salts. The cold salts are satellites, light trucks, 
We have a lot of Puerto Rico that we have not this opportunity during the Hurricane Maria. We have microwave installs as a backup to offer redundancy and to uh, the capacity for the communications. We have a solar equipment to recharge uh, the air telecom infrastructure. We have um, an amount of inventory with batteries, generators. We have uh, carriers that have two generators on each tower in Puerto Rico before Maria. We may have one generators, but in each tower we have represented the whole carriers. Each tower may have AT&T, may have a Sprint, may have the whole carriers. One generator was not sufficient. And the, the time that elapsed without electricity, they are not support with one generator. Mm -hmm. They have now on more than one generator by each carriers on each uh, 2,000 towers that we have uh, in Puerto Rico. We have a uh, significant uh, amount of inventory of tools and for maintenance and replacements. We, uh, they have uh, provide uh, their proper tanks to have the diesel and the gas that it was a mess after Maria because we have no place to obtain the gas and the diesel, the same that happened to each working people in Puerto Rico. It was a mess to obtain it. And without that, the generator can work and the, the, the trucks of the, uh, each company to repair cannot go away. We have also, uh, for example, more than 750 miles of fiber optic undergrounds. And for the end of the years, we, will have, we are going to have, and the challenge is to have more than 1,000 miles of fiber optic trenching or undergrounds in Puerto Rico. This is important because, uh, if you remember, uh, the postes uh, on which every cable were attached went down with the hurricanes and they have not supported. Now on, we have trenched the fibers and the, the cables, excuse me, for them to be protected and more resistant uh, during the emergency. Uh, we have uh, going on in the construction of the suburban cable going through the uh, through south to Ponce and maybe for Umacao. We are trying to negotiate with them to extend it to Umacao, Puerto Rico because we have only the whole landing station in the north part of the island. This is a big risk for the people of Puerto Rico if we have an earthquake because we are going to keep out communication with the rest of the world. And we need data and we need communication to those guys continue working and for the economic development of, in Puerto Rico. For that, we have uh, going uh, to different parts, touching people. We need a submarine cable coming from the south and we have a pleasure to let you know that when I said, me puedo morir ahora, Cuando hubo la conferencia de prensa, because since uh, 2010, I am trying to do so. And I think that at the end of the years, or in the beginning of 2020, it's going to be a reality for the people of Puerto Rico. Because una falla en el norte de Puerto Rico, as I mentioned before, nos vamos a quedar incomunicados del resto del mundo. Pudimos desarrollar during the emergency a GIS map of which had represented the whole infrastructure to the telecom industry in order for the inclusive FEMA, the FCC when it came to Puerto Rico, uh, the people from the PREPA and the whole people who went to the convention center may have the opportunity to see where they are, uh, every, every telecom infrastructure affected when it was repaired, when they are on and they, when they are working inclusive for las carreteras de Puerto Rico, cuáles estaban cerradas, cuáles tenían debris, cuáles había que removerlas para 
eh, abrir camino uh -huh. para que tanto energía eléctrica como telecomunicaciones going out to fix uh, and, and, and bringing up the electricity and the telecom service. Sabemos todos que se depende de la energía eléctrica en un 100%. Cada telecom infrastructure needs electricity to continue their operation, incluso the central office. Mucha gente no entiende, dice, pues si la torre está ahí, ¿por qué no tiene comunicaciones? Si la oficina central, los que saben un poco más que yo de tecnología, saben que para tú enviar ese mensaje que te llega a tu celular, tiene que salir de una oficina central, comunicarse durante todo ese proceso, llegar a través de esa antena que está en la torre, y si esa antena no está, esa torre no está energizada, la antena no puede continuar el proceso para que tú puedas puedas tener el servicio de telecomunicaciones. That is important to have power uh, for the continuity of the telecom services. ¿Qué estamos haciendo nosotros como ISF número 2 y como responsable de mantener las comunicaciones operando durante y después de una emergencia, asegurándonos que cada uno de los proveedores en Puerto Rico tenga lo que ya hemos verificado en cada uno de sus inventarios. Estamos trabajando directamente con la FCC in order to obtain more funds for create a resilience and a robust infrastructure in some municipalities in the central part of the island that they need to have support in terms of the telecom services. Son 12 municipios que hemos presentado ante la FCC que presentan los mayores retos de inversión de parte del sector privado de telecomunicaciones para levantar la infraestructura de telecomunicaciones en esas áreas. En ese sentido, estamos buscando esos 760 millones de dólares de la FCC que sean parte y que las compañías de telecomunicaciones pongan el resto del dinero para levantar toda la infraestructura y poderle brindar un backup en microondas o en satélite. Lo mismo para la isla de Vieques y de Culebra, que también siguen representando un reto en términos de los servicios que se ofrecen. Durante ese proceso de emergencia logramos que un sector tan competitivo como lo es el sector de las telecomunicaciones lograra el acuerdo de roaming histórico, acuerdo que ha sido y va a ser tomado en consideración por la Comisión Federal de Telecomunicaciones para futuras emergencias en los diferentes estados. Si no hubiésemos logrado ese acuerdo de roaming voluntario con la industria de telecomunicaciones, no hubiésemos podido comenzar a que la gente pudiera tener al menos una llamada telefónica con algún familiar suyo durante este proceso de emergencia. Como él mencionó, los Google Looms, conseguimos el waiver para que se pudiera instalar un piloto experimental en Ceiba para que muchas de las proveedoras llegaran a acuerdos con Google para poder también tener servicios de telecomunicaciones. De nuestra parte, ahora en abril comenzamos los talleres con toda la industria de telecomunicaciones y manejo de emergencia para prepararnos de cara al evento del 2000, junio del 2019 que ya está ahí, que comienza nuevamente la temporada de emergencia. El mapa georreferenciado lo mantenemos allí al servicio de cualquiera de ustedes que quiera irlo a ver, ¿verdad? Hay unos layers que se mantienen confidencial por la naturaleza de la infraestructura de cada una de estas compañías, por la naturaleza confidencial de cierta parte de la infraestructura de energía. Tenemos también los hospitales más importantes georreferenciados también en ese mapa. Y fue de mucha utilidad y yo sé que en futuras emergencias va a seguir siendo de mucha utilidad para poder ¿verdad? Eh, movernos y saber hacia dónde son los lugares eh, que ahora existen. Porque te, quiero que sepan que hay muchos sitios que ya desaparecieron y rutas que desaparecieron que jamás pudieron volverse a abrir, particularmente rutas por donde estrechamente subían las 
las compañías a poder reparar sus torres de telecomunicaciones ya son existentes, ha, ha, ha habido que abrir rutas alternas y rutas nuevas. Llegar a Yunque no fue algo fácil, ahí se perdió la cadena, eh, la antena que servía a la, a la televisora, las antenas de telecomunicaciones, antenas que están, estaban allí del gobierno federal, para repararlas hubo que llegar en helicóptero. Usted mencionó Castañer. Castañer fue un reto para las transacciones del departamento de la familia. Tuvimos que llevar un micro, una antena de microondas, lo recuerdo muy bien, en un helicóptero. Frances me acompañó en ese proceso para poderla instalar en el único colmado que había allí para que la gente pudiera transaccionar y comprar alimentos. Y lo digo, eh, lo digo eh, graciosamente porque decía el señor, no hay ATH, un cartón bien grande, no hay ATH. Nosotros llegamos con la antena, denos la oportunidad de instalar esta antena para poder servirle a esta comunidad. Y el señor bien negativo. Le instalamos una antena de una entidad sin fines de lucro que la donó. Y él vio que pudo hacer la transacción inmediatamente, tachó el no del cartón, hay ATH. Y o sea, la comunidad que no había podido salir porque se cerró el, el canal de acceso, porque el puente se cayó a, a cientos de pies de distancia, le quedaba el próximo supermercado, perdieron los vehículos, estaban a pie y pudieron transaccionar y comprar sus, sus alimentos. La torre de energía eléctrica de esa área acabó en la... Exactamente. Acabó en la... La ambulancia y varios... I'm sorry for speaking in Spanish, <laughs> but I'm worse than sorry I don't want to tell you. Let, let me just uh, take the, the lead there. Um, thank you so much for, for your words, Sandra. Um, it's like you were if you were an encyclopedia with everything that was happening at well, that time, and we appreciate the information. We leave 60 days on the convention <laughs> center in Inwisa. I know. I, I just appreciate, all, I saw your work from the beginning, and thank you for, for all your I, I, we have a challenge. Our time is running out. We probably have at the most 10 minutes. So, I'm gonna, and I still want to see if Emilio has some final comments. But I still want uh, to hear. And I'm only going to give you like three minutes, also, please. So, I'm sorry so, because it takes a lot of time. <laughs> I think you, can, you, know, you can do this. In three minutes. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would yeah, I would like to comment uh, Sandra for what she has explained. I think we. We should be encouraged to know that all this effort, uh, it, was, it was difficult times. I also wanted to uh, react to something that Javier said, that um, the government had difficult circumstances, but there were organizations that play a part, uh, and a primary part for sometimes for months until the government came. And I mentioned this because that's why my organization exists right now. We, right now, as we speak, I'm connecting about eight sites in Culebra uh, with satellite communications. The police department, the mayor's office, the clinic, uh, 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 a nonprofit organization, and others. And, and it's still a system that is used daily. It's a backup system, and I want to emphasize that we are not a primary service, it's a backup service. But people want to have it there because if there is another problem, they want to have that backup assurance. We have even right now uh, uh, credit unions connected their ATH, uh, ATH, uh, connected to it with our system. Uh, we have community-based organizations also connected. In fact, we have one that have a radio station that is connected to the satellite because they believe right now is still the most um, stable in terms of getting out there to the internet. So our role, and I want to emphasize this very much, is that we want to complement the existing providers in Puerto Rico. They, they are trying hard under difficult circumstances, and that's why we consider ourselves a community-based effort, coming to, as Javier said, to come in and complement what they do. I'm encouraged also, and I learned a lot here today, I'm in this industry, uh, with the approach that they want to take, because I believe uh, uh, that it's a very comprehensive approach. And we ourselves are trying to bring in the locations that we are trying to connect, uh, solar power, water, 
uh, training. We believe that training is the most important thing that we can bring to these facilities. If people are not trained before a disaster, how to use the technology, how to organize themselves. So we want to be, as Javier said, the, the, uh, the, the, como, tu sabes una palabra que me, que la copié aquí. If we, if we do, we, if we don't have a network out there. Mesh. Okay, mesh. mesh. No, no, mesh. no, no, it was something else. You mesh. said um, a, a committing, hold, a holding, okay. a holding fort. Uh, uh, yeah. Hold the fort. Hold the fort. <laughs> if we, if we, if the community does not constitute a holding fort to help these other biggest, bigger companies help the government, okay, to uh, to provide services for those critical hours, then we are we have we have a problem. So we need with this board. We've been talking to the FCC, as I mentioned. We've been talking to members of Congress, and we have been very surprised the amount of support that they see for this kind of effort. And I'm very encouraged, something Sandra said, the, the telecommunications sector is getting together in the, we would like to be part of that. Because what we're doing right now, what we're learning from the uh, constituents that we have, and the ones that we're continuing adding, is something that we want to share, and we want to be able to work together with the industry. Oh, I uh, and I, I wanted, I hope, actually, that you give it some opportunity to people to react, because the, you know, everybody here has said something very important, but, but we would like to, you know, I'm going to give the time now. So I, I, I would like to hear from some of you, uh, your reactions to what we have said and how your organizations see what we have described I'd here, like to, like to that, that. how they can help you. Let, let's, let's with that, because before passing to Kimberly, which will be last immediately, would you like to add some final comments? Yeah, we, we talked about uh, a lot of, uh, about rebuilding. And, and one thing that neither one of us has talked about is economic development. Mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, it's, it's as important to restore and make necessary reform. The government needs to do necessary structural reforms. <coughs> uh, taking, taking, in, taking uh, advantage of the reconstruction efforts, the $82 billion today program that is uh, that is pledged up until now, to do all the reform that is necessary, right size the government, and let let the private sector and the NGOs uh, really luring uh, capital to get uh, sustainable economic drivers. Uh, there are four areas that we need to work on, and those are uh, knowledge economy, agro-industries, manufacturing, and tourism. So, and for that, we need, we need a holistic approach in which the workforce needs to be trained for those drivers that can sustain our, our economy in the long run. And bear in mind, I'm going to leave you with two sets of data uh, regarding the workforce development in, 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 and this is on a world scale. Freelancing in America study uh, published in 2018 uh, concluded that 93% of people with a college degree would said that they would give more value to skills than 79% would give more value to the college education. And that is very important because the gap between a college education and, and affordability is widening by, by the year. And not all the jobs that are gonna be out there will require a college degree, will, will require skills. So we need to prepare our youth for that. And the other one is from the World Bank that they had concluded that 65% of children entering primary school today will end up in jobs that do not exist today. So we need, we need to be aware of the, of the changing environment that the job uh, market is gonna have. We need, to, we need to 
give more value to the education of our children moving forward. Should we focus maybe some changes in terms of the approach uh, uh, from the education part because we need to adjust the reality of the uh, jobs with respect to the preparation of those students when they are going out uh, for the work. Absolutely. It has Absolutely. to be the other way around. Yeah. The kids need to be work ready when they graduate. Yes. And, and I think that it's a trend that it's worldwide so we just need to jump into the bandwagon. Uh, we are doing it in the construction industry. We expect up to 2,100 students will be work ready uh, in the next two months. Actually, our, our children will be competing with robotics right. in their generation. So, so let me pass it up. Is that, that, would that be your final, yep. final comment? Let me pass the final words for Kimberly. Would you like to share yes. some words with us? Well, at this point, although I think that you would find interesting the, the mix of projects going on across the island where innovation is at work. And so our people and leaders with vision, and it's coming from the community, and it's coming from collaboration. And so I think if I could only say a few minutes, rather than talk about, I would like to say I have some connection to the Resilient Mesh Project that Javier said, and I'm so proud of the leadership that you're providing the right direction. And each person here is providing <coughs> that. So if I was to say, and kind of play off what you said, Emilio, because it goes full circle into our right work, today, tomorrow, and into the future, children and adults alike. And um, Puerto Rico's moment is to reimagine herself, as well as rebuild with a few friends um, who have some experience to bring shoulder to shoulder. I believe very strongly in a legitimate model of co-creation and collaboration because all of us, none of us is smart as all of us, and most of the time all of us aren't invited to the table. But I have the privilege around the world to set the table differently, and the outcome is very different as well. Genius comes out of each participant. And that adage of the sum is greater than its part becomes alive and becomes the vision for the future and the blueprint to do that. Part of what I'm here is to champion the fact that no one should be left out of this conversation. We should convene differently and we should uh, be training with everything, education and training not only about how to do what's here, but how do we lead the future. Like I want young and old alike to know the principles of sustainability. What does that actually mean? What is a regenerative future look like and how would I create it and how would I lead? In a new principle, working together. What, what I heard here are people who believe in that too. If we believe in that too and lead it by example, we become that model, that's actually the most important work we're here to figure out how to do together. I think that's why we're well, thank you for that. Before we jump into questions, I just want to make one last comment. And the fact is that Kimberly was the last panelist to join us. And she asked me, I mean, she told me, how would I do this if you're going to do a, a panel in Spanish? And I, I told her, please trust me, in Puerto Rico we can flip from Spanish to English just like that and we will follow it. So we, we did that at the last minute and I think it worked out pretty good. Thank, right, you. thank you for your graciousness. I'm working on my end of that day. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, uh, I think it was awesome and, and very, very interesting, uh, every one of the uh, uh, presentations, but I would prefer that the, uh, you as the audience would, would come up with the questions and, and, and establish maybe a brief debate or discussion or conversation about the things we've discussed so far. Feel free. I mean, you mentioned about the collaboration, and I truly believe in that. Um, how do you see those two working together for, to, to accomplish what you have and what you have said? <clears throat> what recommendations do you have for us here? Well, I work in public private partnerships, so I only work when I mix it up at the table because um, there is no issue we're facing in Puerto Rico or the world that any one sector organization, entity, or person can handle. So actually, you're just surrendering to the math itself. But instead of going there holding our nose, 
I think that we should go there opening our arms and our minds and our hearts. And it takes some leaders who will convene and not back down, not play politics, not let one uh, uh, organization rule. And so it takes some courage. But what I found, there's a, 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 a book that I uh, teach from called Organizing Genius. And it was written many years ago about global leadership. But it said, how do you organize a great group? And a great group was called a group that makes a dent in the universe. And I said, that's my job right there. I want to be a group that makes a dent in the universe. And they said that the common denominator, because they were cross sectors and cross, and cross uh, eras, but the one thing they had in common is that what was the boss was not a person. What was the boss was the vision. If you can create a vision together that you all buy into, and you all follow that, it's like it's got the pull. It's the magnet that pulls the leadership forward. And you do that by doing the work and by setting the table. Anybody else? I guess my question would be for Emilio. You mentioned that for April, you have 2,100 uh, students in line to be capacitated, uh, but they're seniors. How about the other part of uh, project managers, higher states uh, workforce that will be needed for all the projects? Well, we, we are starting with school kids, okay, for seniors. And the reason we started for that is for uh, child, uh, students that will probably not go, no, don't want to go to university to get a college degree so they could be work ready. Yeah, that would be in May. In April, we are training the teachers. Okay. okay. After that, we are starting to branch out into uh, trades, skills, and, and different other demographics. For example, we are now partnering with a private uh, vocational school in Puerto Rico that will start probably after the summer doing some training. And we are also, that will take care of the young adult population that are not in, if they already left school. Okay, be by abandonment or they dropped out or they already graduated but they don't have the skills to go into the, into the construction market. The other, the other area we're looking at is an NGO who has an educational arm that can get some kids also uh, trained. They will probably not do carpentry as our first trade that we're deploying. They will probably do electricity or even maybe solar installation, depending on, on how the agreements come about. But for us, the important thing is that what, whoever gets trained through our program will get a nationally recognized certification process. What that means is that their training will be as valid in the whole nation as my engineering degree. And, and I think that's the most important part of it all. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot do it all at once. We have to try to increase our own capacities as long as we can. Our model has been partnering. For example, we already partnered with the Puerto Rico Department of Education. And the secretary was graceful enough to take us in and let us deploy the program in the public system. Uh, there are some schools in the private sector that will do it. Hopefully, we can even expand to correctional facilities. Uh, that will require a different kind of, of training, probably bringing trainers from, from the states. We already tried uh, using uh, people from correctional facilities in the construction industry around 19 years ago when there was a shortage of, of labor also. What we did not do was train, properly train the workforce. And I think the only way that we can accomplish that and the needs that we're going to need around 100,000 new workers in the industry. So if if there's an executive order raising that minimum wage to lure people in from other industries, 
the least we can do is train them so they understand the risks and they understand what they need to do to work in a safe environment in our projects. I just want to uh, say that there are models already uh, for what you're doing, especially in the prisons, bringing training for skill sets mm -hmm. uh, using distance learning. So we we can talk later on about that. Yeah, we we are we are bringing we are bringing probably uh, HPI certification for that, or for some of the schools. So what what we're trying to do is. What is HPI? HPI is the Home Builders Institute. Okay. Yes. Okay. So their base is in Washington D.C. There's a there's there are not for profit, but they are they really do certification of trace yeah, management. But Julia, we Julia could Keller is working with a, a distance learning program for the education. Who's that? With them. Julia Keller. They, they what yes. we could what what we could probably do is uh, have have assistance for distance learning. There's a few people that do it here in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. but we could probably do some partnering and see how much people can we reach. The, the important thing is that we will need to train trainers to do it in Spanish for most of the population. Uh, the books, we, we have ways to, ha to get in books in Spanish. Uh, probably is having the trainers to do the distance. Uh, Answering his question, uh, we put together years ago uh, a program uh, with, the, with this group, the builders, how to train a construction, a green building construction manager mm -hmm. to the extent, and, uh, along with your recommendation or your question. So it could be done, so we could. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea here is that some of, some of us might be doing things that others can come in and complement, mm -hmm. and that's what right. one of the right. ob objectives here. So. We would like we, to talk. I think yeah, we had another question. question in the back. No, guys. No? I have one. Yes. Yo me quería saber cuáles son los municipios que usted tiene, los 12 municipios que tienen un problema. Tenemos en la zona montañosa, tenemos Sudwaro, tenemos el área de Ciales. Todo, todos los municipios que corren a través de la parte de la cordillera y Vieques y Culebra, que todavía siguen siendo un reto en términos no solamente de telecomunicaciones, sino del servicio de energía eléctrica. Sí, la alarma. La, 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 ¿Acá? Sí, no, ¿De, acá, ¿De Oaxaca acá. o...? No, no, no. ¿Usted trabaja en Oaxaca acá? No. No, no, no. Es la, es la Asociación no, de Salud Primaria. Ah, Pero ¿sabes? parte de lo que estamos eh, promoviendo es que los centros, para que tengan idea, Plaza de las Américas, uh -huh. si eh, recolectar el agua serían 300 millones de galones al año. Sí, lo sé. Así que nuestros centros, algunos de ellos tienen un techo extenso y podemos eh, recolectar esa agua para los inodoros, para eh, diferentes funciones, gray water le dicen, sí. Sí, no potable, eh, y que, que en el día a día nos ayuda porque si usamos esa agua eh, liberamos a los embalses para agua potable. Exacto, eso, eso es parte de lo que en la infraestructura de Green Buildings que ellos están Sí, yo sugiero que llamen al US Green Building Council de Puerto Rico y al fundador, eh, eh, profesor Abruña, eh, que tiene, que tiene libros, libros extensos en español hechos en Puerto Rico, eh, con toda esa información. Se debe montar para el edificio público, hospitales, centros comerciales, hoteles, y otros otro otro edificios de empresa deberían ser un requisito en los códigos de construcción. Bueno, hay requisitos sí, sí. ahora mismo. En Con el, el código, nuevo código. Lo, lo hay. Lo hay. Bueno, hay. Si quiere hacer el building, sí. Pero si no, no lo hace. Bueno, déjeme explicarle que si usted quiere acceder al fondo CDBGDR, usted tiene que adquirir una certificación verde okay, para su edificación. Bueno. Pero eso es lo que va a mover el mercado de ahora en adelante. Entendamos, entendamos que la cantidad de dinero va a ser tan masiva que lo que va a mover el mercado va a ser la inversión federal. Y ellos están requiriendo 
Y aquí lo importante es que entendamos cuando vamos a sellos o certificados de sostenibilidad es cuál es el, cuál es el track que más se... Hay una diferencia bien grande entre adoptar y adaptar, ¿verdad? Uh -huh. Aunque cambias una vocal, ¿verdad? Eh, la diferencia es abismal. Y, y la verdad del caso es cuál certificación, que hay muchas. Una es LEED, uh -huh. este, que promulga el Green Building Council, y la hay otra. ¿Cuál es la que mejor se adapta al clima que nosotros tenemos aquí en Puerto Rico? Y la verdad del caso es que nosotros tenemos una contestación para el tema de vivienda, desgraciadamente para edificios que no son vivienda, eh, no hay tanta eh, investigación o datos como para uno tener algo más aclimatado a, a nuestro clima para todo lo que no es residencial. Sí, el, el, no sé, hay... Para vivir, para vivir. Los códigos se adoptaron ya. Se adoptaron. Y sí. se adoptaron el 15 de noviembre. Y el, el, el track que, que funciona, por lo menos para vivienda en un clima tropical, es promulgado también por el Consejo Internacional de Códigos. Le puedo decir esto, que yo me senté en el Comité de, de Adopción de Códigos. Es el ICC 700. ¿okay? Y es, se llama el National Green Building Standard. Donde tiene muchas... Este, requisitos y estrategias para, para ventilación cruzada, este, sistemas de baja energía, edificios de bajo consumo energético, que es mucho más asequible que uno buscar un lead for homes, que está en el orden de 4 o 5 mil dólares por unidad de vivienda, solamente obtener el certificado. No le estoy hablando de costo de construcción. O sea, que, que, que es muy importante, ¿verdad?, que que al momento de, al momento de, de uno escoger uno, y gracias a Dios, HUD aclaró que, que no era un solo sistema de construcción sostenible el que ellos iban a pedir, uno lo, que se iba a escoger proyecto por proyecto. Y eso le da la oportunidad a cada proponente de proyecto, sea este, con fines o sin fines de lucro, a escoger el que mejor sentido le haga. De hecho, Puerto Rico tiene un sistema de permiso verde hace nueve años implantado, que es otro sistema que tiene sus luces y sus sombras, este, y tiene, pero fue promulgado hace, hace nueve años ya para Puerto Rico. Y de hecho, en vez de hacerlo mandatorio, lo que, la estrategia que se hizo en el 2010 fue darle ventaja al que, al, que lo, al que lo adopte precisamente para incentivar el que uno se mueva de un área más convencional a una a un ¿verdad? a estrategias de más sostenibilidad pero contestando su pregunta la verdad del caso es que nosotros mismos en la asociación entendemos que los requisitos que vienen con los fondos federales que son bastantes son muchísimos y dependiendo de la agencia es el requisito que le aplica, este, es lo que va a mover la industria este, de construcción de la, la, de la economía. Una vez, una vez esas estrategias se pongan por eh, inversión este, de dinero federales, es como cuando los impuestos se ponen, nadie los quita. O sea, definitivamente eh, la nueva realidad de Puerto Rico es que las cosas no se van a hacer como se hacían el 20 de septiembre del 2017. Y una vez nosotros los locales entendamos eso de una vez y por todas, ¿okay? y nos pongamos creativos en cómo es que vamos a manejar esos requisitos de ahora en adelante, usted puede estar segura que vamos a poderlo hacer. Y yo creo que a lo mejor, este, y yo creo que el, eh, el Hunter College está haciendo un buen esfuerzo en entrenar a nivel comunitario este, cómo manejarse en cada agencia. Una cosa tan sencilla como nosotros en la asociación el año pasado, yo tuve la oportunidad de ir a DC y pregunté en FEMA cuántos fondos hay asignados a Puerto Rico. Nadie sabía. Nadie sabía. Hubo que pagarle a un economista para que nos dijera cuánto había. Y de ahí salieron los 82 millones que, que nosotros estamos hablando. Bregar con el gobierno federal es un habiéndome criado como un burócrata federal. 
Los que me conocen saben que yo me crié con uno. Es un rico espagueti, un rico plato de espagueti con albóndiga. Cada cual tiene su, sus requisitos. Este, nosotros que nos quejamos de que aquí las cosas son complicadas, las de allá no son mucho menos complicadas. Quiero decir que lo que acaba de decir Emilio en términos de la función de esta conferencia y es que el Centro de Estudios puertorriqueño, la idea aquí es escuchar de ustedes qué recomendaciones tiene para lograr lo que él dice, porque no va a ser fácil y hay que capacitar personas. No hay suficiente gente en Puerto Rico capacitada. Ahí tenemos que capacitar más. El gobierno, con todo el esfuerzo que está haciendo, no va a dar abasto. Así que esa es la idea y queremos escuchar de ustedes, ¿no? ¿Qué es lo que ustedes creen? ¿Cómo ustedes creen que se puede ayudar? Y como bien, y como bien dijo este, el caballero ahorita, el, el aumentar las capacidades no es solamente un tema de los obreros de la construcción, uh -huh. ni de los managers, ni uno tiene que apoderar las comunidades, uno tiene, los empresarios tienen que aumentar sus capacidades, el gobierno está trabajando en manejar sus capacidades. O sea, este, allí, aquí se habla mucho del tema de credibilidad o, o no credibilidad y, y a nosotros, o sea, a nosotros, gente del gabinete, a mí personalmente, a mí no me lo contaron, a mí personal de, de Hot, de, bueno, le puedo decir que fue la ex subsecretaria de Hot, que nosotros nos reuníamos en privado con ella cuando la vez que venía en Puerto Rico nos dijo que ella estaba muy impresionada por el equipo que había en vivienda. El problema que hay es la capacidad de uno manejar la, eh, la asignación de fondos federales más grande que HOT ha hecho en territorio estadounidense en la historia. FEMA no, te confiesa que tiene 442 desastres abiertos. Y el desastre de Puerto Rico es más grande que los otros 441 combinados. ¿Ok? O sea, que eh, entendamos que, que desgraciadamente nosotros nos frustramos a veces como mueven las cosas, pero tenemos que entender que, que hay un tema de capacidades de nuestro lado, del sector privado, del lado de, del lado de los NGOs, del tercer sector, y del gobierno, y cuando digo el gobierno me refiero al municipal, al estatal y al federal. ¿Okay? Ah, bien. Sobre eso quiero añadir ah, para en eso. términos de las comunidades y cada uno de los eh, del sector privado y sin fines de lucro. Una de las cosas nos quejamos del gobierno, el gobierno. si nosotros, en los que no somos gobierno, manejamos sobre el 80% de, de todo desde la producción, eh, de, de, todo menos la, el agua, la luz, eh, pues es, es incumbente de nosotros, es nuestra responsabilidad manejar eso para liberar otras cosas y que cada uno eh, logre poder ayudar a cada uno del gobierno, de FEMA, del que sea que viene a ayudarnos. Eh, ¿Y cómo hacemos eso? Eso lo hacemos con datos. Necesitamos de una manera transparente, real, presentar la situación que hay en cada una de, de, de esas comunidades. Desde los pacientes que estén, y, y eso institucionalmente, si lo quieren ver así en, en la comunidad, usted llegaba y de, de, ¿quién es el que tiene diabetes en este barrio? Y aparecía el líder comunitario y decía, doña fulana que vive detrás de la casa del palo rojo aquel, allí está ella. Y entonces, ¿cómo, cómo empezamos a usar eso? Eh, de una forma, eh, en el caso de nosotros, nosotros queremos eh, saber en eso, en todas nuestras clínicas cuál tiene eh, energía de prepa, cuál está con generador, cuánto dice tiene ese generador, si tiene aceite, si tenemos el agua, si esa agua está limpia, está funcionando la fibra, el microondas, qué, qué está funcionando y que tener un dashboard, una pantalla que podamos saber todos los días qué es lo que está pasando. Eso nos ayuda a nosotros, no, no tenemos eso todavía. Pero eso lo hacíamos a papel. Y entonces cuando llegaba Direct Relief, o llegaba eh, Net Hope, o llegaba FEMA, o llegaba el Coast Guard, o cuando nos reuníamos en el COE, en el tercer piso, y decían, ¿qué es lo que tiene? Y abríamos esa, el papel y podíamos decir 
que está pasando. Si nosotros podemos hacer eso en nuestra casa, en nuestro vecindario, en la comunidad, pues entonces podemos realmente eh, pensar que si hay un terremoto y 10% de Puerto Rico está hecho un desastre, ¿cómo podemos los que tenemos apoyar a los demás? Eh, yo sé que estamos cortos de tiempo, pero todo esto, pues obviamente Archer y yo en el pasado hemos estado trabajando con lo que es el desarrollo de, de banda ancha para Puerto Rico y el plan de banda ancha que fuimos uno de los primeros en la nación americana que tuvimos la, la, la oportunidad de presentarlo a nivel, a nivel federal. Y a mí me, me, me entusiasma muchísimo. Nosotros abrimos centros de internet en comunidades pobres, o sea, en lugares donde la gente no tiene acceso al internet. Y en, en este último año, luego del huracán María, ante la desesperación de muchas personas mayores, estamos digitalizándole los documentos y se los damos en un pendrive con una cadenita. Mire, los medicamentos que usted toma, cosas tan sencillas como esa, el nombre de sus medicamentos, su escritura de la casa, porque para una persona mayor la escritura de su casa es la cosa más importante del su mundo, su vida, su seguro social, la información primordial que ellos tienen, porque uno de los grandes problemas que tuvimos es al momento de llenarle los formularios cuando FEMA quiso, la gente no había, había perdido muchas de esas cosas o no habían podido regresar a sus hogares. Pues el, estamos ahora reforzando esa parte de los centros tecnológicos, ya no solamente para los estudiantes, sino para ese tipo de personas, para brindarle esa ayuda, para que ellos sepan que ahí en ese pendrive que ellos tienen, que lo van a llevar siempre, en lugar de perder el tiempo antes de salir de una emergencia, que lo tengan en su cuellito puesto y puedan salir corriendo. Y eso puede representar salvarle la vida, la vida a la gente. Y hemos estado llegando a las comunidades de esa, de esa manera, a ese sector que es un sector vulnerable de nuestra sociedad creciendo. y que sigue creciendo porque ante el problema de migración que nosotros tenemos, que nuestra gente se nos está yendo, lo que nos estamos quedando son los adultos, como algunos de los que estamos sentados aquí, y un poquito, y un, y un poquito más. Y para esa población tenemos que seguir trabajando. Y yo creo que estas cosas, la tecnología sigue siendo sumamente importante, no solamente en el desarrollo socioeconómico de muchos de los sectores que están representados aquí, del tercer sector de las, de las entidades sin fines de lucro, sino para el ciudadano de a pie. Mi último comentario es que eh, eh, hay que, tenemos que Puerto Rico, tiene que, tenemos que estar seguros de que, eh, como dijo Emilio, el desarrollo económico. Eh, hemos entendido que en la cuestión energética solamente el 10% de la, de la, eh, del dinero que entró a Puerto Rico se queda en Puerto Rico. Si no nos preparamos, eso puede suceder de nuevo. Así que es bien importante que nosotros eh, consigamos, está insistiendo mucho, eh, es bien importante que nosotros consiga, eh, aseguremos que eso no vuelva a pasar y, la, el, y como no va a pasar es que se incluyan los negocios locales para, y, y las e, e instituciones locales para que participen en ese proceso. Yo quiero dejarlo aquí, lo hemos extendido yo creo que por posiblemente 15 minutos o más. Eh, a menos que sea una pregunta o comentario que alguien realmente antes de irse tiene que hacer. Solamente acaba de decir es importante que para participar en los fondos que están asignando las compañías se certifiquen. Los requerimientos para estos programas son tener una línea de crédito de 50, 60 millones que empresas en Puerto Rico no las tienen. Y la única participación posible es que seamos empresas certificadas que por mandato de asignación de esos fondos tienen que reclutar un por ciento. Y mientras más empresas haya, mayor podemos exigir que sea ese por ciento. De hecho, es el propósito de esta actividad para que creamos ese tipo de conciencia. Gracias, Mike. Mike es compañero de la industria de muchos años, sector de telecomunicaciones, telemedicina. Y no te digo un de score, tratando, tratando de promover la certificación. Llegó en el último minuto y hasta ahí mismo participó. Así que, habiendo dicho todo eso, solamente me resta Agradecer a usted por su gentileza estar aquí con nosotros compartiendo y este panel tan divertido que nos ha invitado con
mucha información, muy valiosa. Muchas gracias. gracias.